Grace be to you and peace from God our Father, who has adopted us as his children through baptism, calling us to faith in Christ, washing away our sin, giving us a new birth into a new life, and giving us the gift of eternal life, my fellow redeemed. This morning we're going to read two portions of God's word for the basis for our sermon. First of all, we'll read from 2 Kings chapter 5. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. The bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, said the king of, Ar the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Secondly, we also read from 1 Peter 3.21. This water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the word of our God. Naaman was a man's man. He was the military man. He probably could do a hundred push-ups and then go out for a mile or maybe a four mile run with a full pack on without breaking a sweat. He was popular, he was powerful, he was loved by his boss and respected by everybody. He was the top general in Aram's army. He was a valiant soldier, he was a winner in battle. Naaman was at the top of his game. He had it all. He also had leprosy. It was the cancer of his day. It was the slow, sure, incurable ticket to death. There were no miracle drugs. There was no chemotherapy for it. There was no cutting edge surgery. 
Once the doctor made the diagnosis, there was nothing left to do but make the best of it until you died. And that made Naaman a desperate man. It made him the kind of man who would do anything or try anything just to find a cure to keep living. He was like the cancer patient today who would try even the wildest and the craziest sounding and the most off-the-wall types of things and who would travel anywhere in the world just to find a way to get better. He looked for hope anywhere that he could find it. He would try anything just to live. That's because desperate men do desperate things. I'm sure that with his position in power, he had the best treatment and the best doctors that money could buy. I'm sure his king spared no expense to do anything that Naaman could get in order to save his life. But Naaman's biggest hope came from the lips of a 12-year-old slave girl. A little girl whom he himself had captured, dragged away from her home, forced here to live and work in his own house. But the ray of hope came from this girl who showed him love and mercy in spite of what he had done to her. And from the lips of this preteen girl came his, his hope. As she said to him, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, she would cure, he would cure him of his leprosy. Taking her advice was grasping at straws. What could some prophet from a broken down country a country that was so broken that it couldn't even stand up to his, any of his raiding parties. What could a prophet from a country like that do for him that none of the doctors in Aram could do? Hmm. But who knows? Those doctors hadn't been able to do anything for him at all. And so he would do anything to live because desperate men do desperate things. And in listening to this 12-year-old girl and to the words of the prophet to whom she sent him, Naaman discovered God's miraculous waters. As you and I talk about baptism in our worship this morning, we also learn about God's even more miraculous water that gives us an even more miraculous healing. It gives us more than just an extension in life. It gives us a brand new life, and it gives us eternal life. Naaman arrived at Elisha the prophet's doorstep filled with anticipation and hope. The girl said that that prophet had the miracle cure for Naaman. And Naaman, being a religious man, knew, or at least he believed, that the gods, because remember Naaman worshipped coming from a heathen country, he worshipped all kinds of gods, and Naaman believed that the gods could do anything if they felt like it if they felt like it. So far it seemed like his gods didn't feel like doing anything for him. None of the heathen gods could help him, but he thought that just perhaps maybe this God in Israel called the Lord could do something and would do something. So he showed up at Elijah, Elisha's doorstep with an entourage that was fitting his power and his position, he also showed up with a boatload of cash and gifts because he would pay anything to live. But his hopes were quickly dashed. The prophet himself didn't even come out to greet him or say anything to him. 
What an insult to such an important man. Instead, the prophet just sent a messenger with some ridiculous instructions. Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. Naaman had been ready to do anything to get better. He would have attacked any challenge that the prophet had given him. But seven dips in the Jordan River? Desperate men will do desperate things, but this was just humiliating and insulting to a man like him. And so he stormed off in a rage, spitting angry words from his mouth. I thought that he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? Why did I bother traveling all this way for this? For years to come, he would thank God for those lowly servants who had the guts to confront him and say to him, my father, um, if, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more than when he tells you just wash and be cleansed? And so setting aside all his logic and swallowing his hurt pride, and trusting in God's promise, he went and he dipped himself and washed himself seven times in the Jordan River. And amazingly, he was cured. His leprosy was completely gone. In fact, the scripture says that through that amazing jump in the river seven times, his skin was like that of a young boy, not an older man. You know, the water didn't have anything to do with it. <clears throat> the water in the Jordan River didn't have any healing powers. You know, Naaman was probably right that the rivers back home were probably better than the rivers in Israel. I mean, the Jordan wasn't a spectacular river or anything. It's kind of a dirty, muddy, slow-moving, filthy river. The water didn't have anything to do with it. Naaman was cured because God's promise of healing was connected with that river water. God promised that healing would come through this seemingly foolish way, and it did. And with that, Naaman experienced the power of God and the power of God's word, and you know it changed him forever. Gone were all of his superstitious beliefs and all of the heathen gods back home. He had now come to faith in the Lord, the only true God, the creator of heaven and earth, the God of salvation. And, and with that, and with that, he was now a believer in the true God. And later on, Naaman would come back and he would confess, now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. He hadn't been just healed physically, he had been healed spiritually. As he came to faith in the God of salvation, and he now had the gift of eternal life. And that, that was a far bigger healing and cleansing than just getting better from the cancer of his day. Okay, so now this morning we come to the water of baptism here, huh? 
nothing special about it. It's just kind of plain, ordinary old water. I, I got it from the faucet in the room over there. Yeah, I poured it into a fancy bowl. And, and here's the big secret. I used the not very fancy orange plastic Tupperware pitcher to pour it in there. And we don't use much of it in a baptism, a handful or maybe three. Not a whole lot to it. Okay. And so it seems just as silly and foolish to believe that that, that through this ordinary water in baptism that God would bring us to faith in Jesus, even bring an unreasoning, unthinking infant to faith in Jesus, wash away our sin, change our lives, and give us eternal life in heaven. That's a much bigger healing than any cancer treatment. That kind of thinking that through this plain, simple, ordinary water that God would do great things, that kind of thinking is offensive to our human logic and our human pride. It doesn't make any sense at all. It seems too simple and too ordinary. Like Naaman, we think that something big's got to happen. Or that you and I need to do something to, to get those kinds of gifts from God. And that's why our sinful nature stubbornly refuses to believe that God could do such great things through such simple, ordinary means. In fact, because of that, there are a lot of people who reject the power of baptism and who have, who have turned this into nothing more than, than just some ceremony by which we somehow prove our commitment to God and show him that we're serious about him, but that's all it is. It's something we do for God. That's what they say. But God says differently. God says that baptism is a powerful means by which he works faith in the unbelieving human heart takes away our sin completely and forgives it completely, completely changes our lives and gives us a new life to live and gives us eternal life with him. And how can baptism do that? Peter answers that question for us in our next reading for today, where he says, the water of baptism saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God, it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Just like the water of the Jordan River couldn't really do anything to help poor old Naaman, the water in baptism all by itself can't do anything either. But the water of baptism, Peter says, has the power of Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection connected to it. The power that God used to overcome death and to raise Jesus from the dead and bring him out of the grave is the same amazing almighty power that God connects to that plain, simple, old, ordinary water. And that's what makes baptism a powerful, miraculous water. Because in our baptism, we are joined together and connected to Jesus. We are connected to Jesus who won spiritual healing for us. Like Naaman, we were dying. Not from leprosy, not from cancer, not from some other horrible disease, but we were dying from sin. And sin does more than just put you in a grave. Sin condemns you and me to eternal death and hell forever. But Jesus came with the cure. He lived the holy life that God demanded of us. He lived it for us. By his death on the cross and, and there the shedding of his blood, he paid for all of our sins. By his resurrection from the grave, he not, overca not only overcame the power of death, but he also assures us that our sin 
is still lying in that grave somewhere, somewhere. That sin is still dead and it's never going to come back to hurt us again. Jesus and his saving work put the power into the water of baptism. And so Paul can say in Galatians chapter 3, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So when God promises to forgive our sins and give us all kinds of other wonderful gifts, the power of his word and the power of Jesus' saving work are there to make baptism the miraculous water that it is. And though there's no special commitments that you need to make, there's no invitations that you need to extend to God, there's no decisions that you need to make for Jesus, God just gives you those blessings as a gift. And so rejoice in your baptism. Rejoice in your baptism. It is God's powerful means through which he does wonderful things for you. Use your baptism every day. Let your baptism remind you every day that you are a dearly loved and a forgiven child of God. And use your baptism every day as the power that God gives you to, to, to live as the child of God. And, and you know, if you or your children aren't baptized, just ask. We're glad to share those healing, miraculous waters with you. And if all of this sounds just a little bit too foolish to your human reason, then remember that God's word and God's promises trump our human reason every single time. Just ask Naaman. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which transcends all our understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. I invite.